Uh, good morning, and um, thank you very much for this uh, kind invitation. I'm speaking from the UK here today, and welcome to this plenary session on privacy and cybersecurity in the 5G era. I'm very privileged today to be joined by the group of three distinguished speakers, and will shortly ask each of the speakers to introduce themselves and their organisations, as well as any key sound bites they would wish to share prior to today's discussion. Uh, firstly, we're very pleased to be joined by Bill O'Hearn, the Chief Information Security Officer at AT&T. Mani Sudaram, Executive Vice President and Chief Information Officer at Kami. And Christine Gadsby, Vice President, Product Security at BlackBerry. So Bill, in the first instance, please could I ask you to make a short five minute introduction to yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Alex. Hello to everyone. I'm pleased to be here in virtual Miami, but uh, actually coming to you from our global network operations center in Bedminster, New Jersey. You know, the last time we changed G's from 3G to 4G, let's think about what happened. We got the explosion of apps and all the ways our smartphones have revolutionized the mobile economy. Now we're on to 5G and there's been a lot of hype and I'm really excited to see this hype manifest into reality. You know, the combination of lower latency, massive connectivity, and faster speeds will eventually create and transform communications, retail, and the autonomous vehicle experience. It's going to be possible to build smart factories and revolutionize healthcare. And we think, it, you know, it can be more than that. 5G can help dissolve some major divides in the country, the digital divide, access divide, and resource divide. You know, on the digital divide, we saw how many students fell behind during COVID because they didn't have access to internet. Getting an internet connection to all American households is a goal of the Biden administration and one that we support. And on the access divide, we got a pretty good taste during the pandemic that telemedicine can work well. Imagine the boost for something like a teaching hospital when your doctor could be a thousand miles away. And on the resource divide, I think we could be on to something big. Imagine the ways that millions of sensors could combat food waste or traffic congestion, water constraints. So that's the big picture. But, you know, on this panel, we're talking about how we work to secure all of it. And that's my job as CSO. You know, AT&T has a really unique, unique vantage point here to make security observations. We, we have a global network that carries 465 petabytes of data traffic on the average day. But we're also a retailer. We have direct-to-consumer services, and we serve large global and federal customers. We touch every vertical that exists. The good news is that 5G will improve security as networks reach full compliance with 5G industry standards. It will offer more privacy for your identity and stronger encryption for your call. And it's run by smarter network software. Securing the 5G ecosystem will be a shared responsibility like a public cloud. You know, protecting the ex explosion of diverse connected things is going to require real attention to things like strong authentication, endpoint security, and automation. Thanks for having me, and I'm looking forward to a good exchange of ideas today. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, fascinating stuff, and I look forward to talking with you shortly. Uh, Manny, if I could ask you to introduce yourself, please. Thank you. Uh, it's actually great to be in person in Miami. I'm really enjoying the experience. This is the, the, my first in-person event in more than a year and a half. Uh, but yeah, this is, uh, I'm Mani Sundaram. I work at Akamai Technologies. I'm the CIO and EVP there. Akamai is uh, the renowned, one of the renowned cybersecurity vendors on the internet. Uh, we, we got our start 20 plus years back out of MIT, uh, helping make the internet faster at that time, but now we are known as, uh, as one of the top security providers on the internet. And at Akamai, I run three functions. I run our services and support organization, also run platform security, as well as uh, being the CIO out there. Uh, I am really excited to be here to learn from uh, this panel and, and, and this event on you know, what it takes for us to secure 5G in the future. As all of us know, we, we all, many of us have 5G devices with our phones, but it's only going to get more and more uh, per, um, 
uh, within our society. It's going to get uh, ingrained within our society. So how do, we, how do we protect all of these devices? How do we protect our society, society as a whole is something that I'm interested in, in learning, but also working with everybody in this room. Thank you. Thank you, Manny. And lastly, Christine. Hi, thank you. Thank you uh, very much. I'm Christine Gatsby, and I'm the Vice President of Product Security here at BlackBerry. My role is really to understand uh, the attack surface that software brings into the ecosystem uh, and to ensure BlackBerry uh, is prepared and, and deals with that top of mind. Um, you know, no, everybody's familiar with BlackBerry, and the new BlackBerry is not the company that we grew up knowing, but rather a company who seven years ago pivoted into a software security company. We connect, secure, and manage every endpoint in the Internet of Things, and that's been our main focus now for, for quite a while. Uh, as we're no stranger to AT&T, Bill, and uh, you know, we've been a long time, long time friends in the industry, um, we're currently divided into two separate houses at BlackBerry um, with, with our products. Uh, one of our focuses in the IoT space or the BlackBerry technical solutions side, uh, including BlackBerry Radar and SecuSuite and Jarvis, but we have products like QNX, which are embedded in more than 175 million cars and 23 of the top 25 electric vehicle OEMs. Uh, and our newly announced IV, which is a global agreement with AWS to develop and market intelligent vehicle data platform that combines BlackBerry's QNX automotive software and AWS's broad portfolio of services, including IoT and machine learning services. On the other side of our house is the cybersecurity arm, um, where we have products like BlackBerry Spark, which is a single platform that merges endpoint management and endpoint security. What's really unique about Spark is it's focused on moving from a reactive security response model to a proactive and predictive model by leveraging our Silence Acquisitions AI. That model is trained against data lakes containing billions of files, good and bad, so that it learns to autonomously convict or not convict files pre-execution. The result of that is ongoing training effort has a proven track record of blocking payloads, attempting to exploit zero days for up to two years in the future. And it's really focused on leveraging artificial intelligence, machine learning and automation to provide improved cybersecurity threat prevention and remediation while offering visibility across all endpoints. Mostly the new BlackBerry takes advantage of the security maturity we've built over the years to securely connect whether that's critical infrastructure, securing utilities, automotive safety, or securing end customers themselves. BlackBerry protects business and points and people with smarter security solutions that are more effective and require less resources to support that produce a better return on investment for their users. And if you'd like to learn more about any of the security products that we have, we are, we are ha having our eighth annual BlackBerry Security Summit where I'm actually speaking on the topic of SBOM. And that's on October 13th. And you can find out more on our website. Christine, thank you. Very interesting. Look forward to exploring further. Um, and then just, just lastly, um, my, myself as the moderator um, today, really, it's my job to uh, bring all this wealth of knowledge that we have around the table together um, to, to give you something meaningful um, as an audience to, to go away with. Um, I, I head the Security and Crisis Management Division of Crisis 24 which is an independent division of Garda World, um, the world's largest privately held security services business. And for 30 years, we've specialized in assisting clients mitigate and respond to threats and risks encountered by organizations all over the world, and very much the nexus between both physical security and where that meets the information security and, and cyber threats that exist. We work either through a combination of crisis and malicious threat insurance coverage, or indeed on a direct basis to governments, corporations and private individuals and families, high net worth, I'll try net and so forth. Um, as cybercrime has become more sophisticated in its nature, with increasing actual and perceived value of the information, the systems that carry it, we've helped these organisations mitigate and respond effectively to cyber attacks, whether that be ransomware, DDoS or breaches resulting in significant negotiation and threat act with, with threat actors and the payment of multi-million dollar cryptocurrency ransom demands. 
with the progression of the digital era and digital technologies, including the telecoms industry, which are network providers, which we're focusing on today, sitting at the heart of national infrastructure and security, these functions have become an attractive target for destabilizing nation states and well-funded and organized threat actors, sometimes instructed or endorsed by such nation states. Over the last 18 months, the cyber threat landscape has significantly evolved. The pandemic has forced a major move towards increased digitization, as we've heard about, remote working, reliance on cloud solutions, and an overall shift to virtual environments has allowed for improved collaboration efficiencies. However, the past 18 months has also saw proliferation of ransomware and data theft, many cases which have been bounded by this new remote working model. Due to the benefits of 5G technology, it is likely to become a key enabler of this new working model, allowing new, more users to be connected remotely and collaboratively, particularly as you've already heard today from the speakers. 5G boasts increased bandwidth speeds, improved latency, and overall enhanced reliability. It's now adopted in over 20 markets, and some sources report that it's expected to contribute around $2.2 trillion to the global economy between 2024 and 2034, with an anticipated 1.8 billion 5G connections globally by 2025. However, with this explosion in interconnectivity also comes a widened attack surface. This is highly likely to see a continued rise in cyber attacks. Many argue that the technology itself is no more vulnerable, but rather that the attack surface itself has widened further. So to our panelists, and in the first instance to Christine and then Bill, please. With increasing reports of both state-sponsored and criminal cybersecurity attacks on individuals, organisations and governments. At a government level here in the UK, we have seen defence spending on cybersecurity significantly increased with the recent Strategic Defence Review. And the US has the National Risk Management Centre, ultimately under the Department for Homeland Security, responsible for 5G, 5G security and a key pillar of the national security infrastructure. For organisations such as yours, please can you both describe the trends you have seen regarding the threat landscape and how it has evolved? So to you, please, first, Christine. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, for years, as uh, you know, I've travelled the globe speaking publicly about software security maturity and the responsibility that software vendors have, you know, to mature their own models. Uh, and the recent acquisition of Silence and us pivoting to that AI supported math model, you know, that, that question that we bring to the battle space is always how will the adversary pivot? Uh, it's top of mind for us constantly. Um, and I think the recent solar winds attack reflects part of that pivot point. Uh, I, you know, I think we're going to see continual thoughtful and strategic criminals who are patiently willing to spread across the cyber software supply chain attack surface and wait for the right time to chain exploits, whether those are evolving um, or not. I think we will continue to see richer targets. I think those richer targets are gonna remain in infrastructure and in government. Um, and you know, to pivot a little bit, we've seen the FBI chronicle in the wake of COVID, you know, how we've seen an increase in spear phishing attacks. Um, and you know, even though, again, we have AI that's been demonstrated for the last six years, we still see tons of headlines full of ransomware attacks. Uh, I also think we will continue to see crime as a service. Um, I think criminals are just going to continue to try and outsmart us. Uh, and again, I think this is why it's critical to pivot towards predictive intelligence versus reactive intelligence. Thank you, Christine. Uh, Bill? Yeah, thanks. I, I agree with Christine. You know, we constantly monitor the threat landscape with the data intelligence that we collect from our networks. And, you know, the threats have become increasingly complex and intense. Combine this with the data spread, given the blended use of, you know, private data centers, public cloud utilities, SaaS and PaaS, you know, service offerings, you know, the security of data is becoming more challenging. Uh, much of the access is related to cred credential harvesting and fraudulent activity. The volume of incidents right now is enormous, and I believe grossly misunderstood and underreported. A uh, key enabler of all of this has been the advent of digital currency, which makes it possible to get away with ransomware attacks from anywhere around the globe. And companies are willing to pay the ransom. So, you know, it's become a lucrative business. If we look at the you know, volume of software and configuration vulnerabilities, 
combined with you know that constant pressure of attackers looking to exploit them, it makes the security and IT job really difficult. We have a world of ransomware as a service. You know, security experts all believe that well-funded groups, perhaps even nation states, develop the malware and run the you know, espionage and extortion campaigns, right along with criminal gangs. This problem is so much bigger than the just, you know, just the cost and embarrassment to individual organizations who get hacked. It's destabilizing trust in services and undermining a lot of the U.S. economy. So we're at a crucial point where we need to think fundamentally about our approach as a nation and as a private sector. Very interesting. Thanks, Bill. And we'll, we'll hopefully come back to that point later about the fusion between um, governmental policy, national policy, and that, that of organizations. Thank you. Um, to my next question, uh, as a global network provider, and this is to Bill, you get a view into the threat landscapes that not everyone has. What do you see as some of the solutions for what we're seeing, as we've just discussed, so that members of the audience can consider those in the context of their own organizations? Yeah, thanks. Look, for me, it all starts with strong, virtual, uh, virtually effortless authentication. And I say virtually effortless because that is the only way that users are going to adopt it. There must be a key focus on pushing strong MFA everywhere and do it in a way that employees and consumers are going to adopt it. I constantly will see attackers shifting away when they encounter MFA. So I think that's a really good starting point. Next, it's really important to protect your data with the proper encryption and masking techniques. You've got to start with a current inventory of your assets and data so that it is protected, not only being encrypted, but pro providing the proper patch levels and configuration controls so that it doesn't get inadvertently exposed. We see a lot of that activity occurring. Um, you know, I think it's a really important point both for your data that you have on-prem on and in the cloud. And additionally, I found it really important to upgrade your endpoint protection tools with the latest kind of AI ML technology to combat these threats. Combining this protection with a robust threat detection and management platform is absolutely critical to quickly identifying and eradicating threats. These are the elements you know, that you need to think of in your program get them to work in orchestration to support one another and really drive at that concept of zero trust. There's a lot of intelligence when you're analyzing user behavior, network traffic flows, and de device level characteristics in your environment. And additionally, you can look to your service providers to, to support you with services such as DDoS protection and network-based security solutions. Thank you, Bill. Um, to my next question and, and to Manny, um, most of us clearly are you know, used to working with 4G um, as we are at the moment. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, 20 or so markets are now seeing the, um, the, the advent of 5G. But what are the key security consider considerations today regarding the use of 5G technology, say in comparison to the earlier cellular networks of 2, 3 and 4G? I think the biggest uh, change with 5G is just the proliferation of the number of devices and the increase in the attack surface that it basically could result in. Uh, we've seen this in the past, even without 5G, we've seen devices uh, like cameras and kettles and refrigerators and so on that were connected that, were, that have been pretty hacked um, pretty wide openly, actually. So with 5G, there's just the risk that this could just blow up big time because you have a huge number of devices and you have incredible connectivity. So, the, so just like as Bill said, the potential to, to run a DDoS attack against uh, widely used infrastructure is becoming a much more common. I think uh, on the positive side, the, the good thing is that we've learned a lot from our experiences with 2G, 3G, 4G. And uh, you know, I think as we start using 5G and as, as services are built on 5G networks, security is much more uh, of uh, an ingrained part of the uh, ecosystem as opposed to an afterthought, which is what it has usually been in some of the earlier technologies. So the hope is as we start seeing more 5G devices that we 
We see security that's baked into the product, uh, conceived as the, uh, developed as the product is actually conceived as opposed to just being layered on top of it. Sure. Well, th thank you, Manny. And, and just, just following on from that and, and this question to, to Bill and Manny, but what makes 5G technology, if anything, um, more secure than earlier cellular networks? And specifically, what additional security measures have been built into those 5G networks? And in your opinion, will these be effective in mitigating risks, both at an at individual level, but also for organizations? If I could address that too. Bill, in the first instance, please. Yeah, sure. Thanks. And, you know, the, the way I see it, 5G will improve security as networks reach full compliance with the 5G industry standards. But it's really going to offer more privacy for your identity and stronger encryption for your call. And most importantly, it's being run by smarter network software. So, you know, for the first time, your connection will rely completely on encrypted identity. Your permanent ID won't be exposed, so unauthorized devices designed to capture phone calls can't locate you. 5G is also going to offer stronger encryption over the air so that when your voice and data travels from your device to the cell tower, it's going to stay confidential. It's you know, essentially more effectively scrambled. And more and more, 5G is being run by smarter software. Really important point. It relies on flexible software from an open community, not specialized hardware from a single company. So no single supplier or country can have undue influence there. Your call is routed through virtualized network nodes, switches and hubs that can be moved instantly from one physical computer to another. You know, if there's a problem, it can be isolated or patched quickly. That's a real benefit of the software driven capability. You know, a few others are, are things such as the mobile edge, which allows us to employ threat detection much closer to the source of attacks. And network slicing is gonna be a huge future benefit of 5G. It, it essentially recognizes that watching a movie is different than performing remote surgery. And, you know, they can be delivered at different service levels. The right security controls can be tailored to each. Yeah, no, Bill's absolutely right. I mean, network slicing is going to be a big thing. The, the concept of actually using software to control a lot of the uh, provisioning and the technology, I think, is, uh, is really incredibly beneficial because it creates that flexibility that people need uh, in order to manage their 5G networks better. Uh, we've also seen uh, an increase in protect protecting services at the edge of the network as opposed to trying to use the core and maybe the cloud data center. So de deploying the protections to the edge of the network is something that we've, you know, many companies like ours have done for quite some time. And I think even with the, with the increase in the devices, uh, those technologies are now coming in using artificial intelligence, machine learning, to start uh, adapting to the newer attacks that are coming up and protecting at the edge of the net. So this, uh, uh, the, the advantage I think that we have with 5G is that we have, we've learned a lot, again, like I said earlier, we've learned a lot from some of our previous experiences and can use that to build a more robust 5G network as, as, it's being, as the services are being deployed out now. Thank you. Um, thank you, Manny. Um, I, I touched upon... Um, where I collect this from, which is that sort of interplay between the physical security side of things and, and where cyber security starts. But how, how might the expansion, and this question to Christine um, and Manny, um, how might the expansion of the cyber physical interrelationship between smart connectivity supported by 5G technology and the telecom networks affect the security of public infrastructure, whether it be smart cities, utility services, transport, et cetera, and other services such as healthcare, manufacturing, consumer goods, supply chain, and, and such like. Um, if I could go to Christine, please, in the first instance. Thank you. Yeah, uh, absolutely fantastic question. And I think we're going to continue to see the shift that we're recently seeing. Um, when you look at things like CISA recently advocating the adoption of the converged structure, where you know security operations and the physical and cyber interests are advanced under a common umbrella. Um, I think there's going to be, and, and I heard this mentioned earlier, a growing, inter, a growing interdependency in technology that creates attack surface. 
um, you know, it removes barriers for an attacker and it enables their ability to leverage lots of information. It's like an exploit superhighway, you know, where there's rich targets at the other end. And so I think we're really going to have to see it, you know, an incredible uh, emphasis put on companies to have a, not only have, a, you know, a holistic unified, uh, unified endpoint security system that advances with a single pane of glass for reaction and detection, but I think it's really going to force companies to hold their software security suppliers, you know, their vendor, their vendors accountable. Um, you know, when you consume that software, you're actually creating a tax surface for your own company. And if you're not holding your vendors accountable and asking them, you know, not only does my software widget do a thing, but you know, what's in that software widget, you know, you're, you're inadvertently just accepting that attack surface in your own environment. Yeah. That, thank you, Christine. And, and just before we go on to Manny, I, I think there'd be many in the audience who probably would agree with that level of, of vendor scrutiny that is now going on. Um, with regard to audits around IT protocols and um, such like, certainly we see that, and um, and it's interesting you say that's going to be a, a continued um, uh, tenet of, of of this era as we move into it. Um, Manny, over to you on this one, please. Yeah, I think in addition to all of what Christine said, I think we'll see more defense in depth, and defense in depth meaning you're going to see defensive postures in different parts of the ecosystem, right? From your device or to your carrier, to your uh, to the site that you're shopping at, to, to anything that you're doing, you're gonna see more and more defensive postures. I think, as everybody knows, you know, if you're protecting your house, you wouldn't want that one door to protect everything that you have. You know, you start putting in different layers of defense, like a fence, like an alarm system, and then you lock your thing, and then inside that you have a safe. So you're gonna see more of that. And that's kind of the only way to protect, because. At the end of the day, I go back to, you know, thinking about an average consumer at home that's now connected to uh, using a connected device like a kettle. That person's not going to know that they have to patch the kettle or they have to, you know, upgrade the software or the firmware. I mean, that, that just, we just know that those things don't happen. And so you have to have manufacturers put in security. You have to have the networks put in security. Everybody is going to have to layer in different security components to make sure that the, the internet is safe and and and. Honestly, things are public infrastructure is protected. Even big hospitals, we saw that recently, even hospitals um, don't have the staff, don't have the, the time or the money to protect everything. And, and so I, I think the, the fact that companies like us can make security easier to consume, I think is going to be a big thing for the evolution of 5G. Thank you. Um, thank you, Manny. And I, I think that, that leads us nicely on to the, the next question. And, and perhaps, Manny, I could ask you to, to explain um, you know, what a bot army is in this next question, just for the, for the audience in the first instance. But how do you protect infrastructure from so-called bot armies, you know, effectively large group of, remote, of remotely controlled um, malicious software that yeah, can so be I created by the proliferation of these devices on 5G? So I can give an example. A few years back, uh, you know, a bunch of students in a university basically looked for uh, cameras that basically were unprotected. And these had the, what we call as a telnet port open. And so they just looked for wide spaces on the internet that had these telnet ports that were open. They were able to connect into it. And so suddenly, all of a sudden, you had maybe you know, hundreds and thousands of web cameras that were connected devices. And using that, they could basically use that as a launch pad to launch an attack against uh, public infrastructure. And this was called the Mirai botnet, happened three, four years back. So good example of how you can do that with unprotected devices. Um, you know, as, a single, as a single hacker, the potential to cause chaos on the internet is reasonably limited. But all of a sudden, if you have hundreds or millions uh, maybe billions of devices now under your control. That's an army, and it's a bot army that you can use to bring down infrastructure very easily, right? Uh, nation states can do that. Rogue, uh, um, rogue actors can do that. And, and that's the biggest concern with 5G, which is now you not only have these devices, but you also have the bandwidth, and now you can really bring down things. So how do you, how do you start protecting these devices is one that you know, a lot of our a lot of companies are in the business of uh, of doing right now. I hope that clarifies what a bot army can be. Sure. No. Th th thank you. Um, thank you, Manny. Um, and to the next question, uh, and to Bill uh, and then Christine, if, if I may. 
Uh, and this regards the legislative framework. Um, do, do you believe that the legislative framework developed um, is it, developed enough to sufficiently govern the security and data privacy ahead of anticipated expansion of systems supported by 5G technology? And specifically, what can be done to improve things in this context? Uh, yeah, it, it's all one internet ecosystem, you know, across companies, technologies, US state borders. Consumers deserve one set of privacy rules. You know, federal legislation should create a unified regulatory regime for privacy, data security, and breach notification. The, the patchwork of state privacy regulations makes it tough for new services to get to consumers, and it can disrupt you know, the internet that consumers expect. The legislation should be consistent with the standards that the FTC has developed and enforced for, you know, more than 20 years. So I think that's the right place to start. Thank you, uh, Bill. And, and to you, Christine, please. Yeah, th th thank you, Bill, for that. And I, I, I want to just draw to everybody's attention that while not technically part of the legislature, uh, the recent cybersecurity executive order is really a game changer in this area, you know, for all of us. You know, I, I'm, I'm seeing a growing sophistication in Congress and the focus on the reality. You know, that legislative reality is that their process lags behind the speed of our adversaries, you know, executing in the shadows. Uh, and, and they count on that delay. Um, so, you know, yes, executive orders are, are, are quicker to wield an effect. And the speed that we're seeing those changes is, is aggressive. Uh, if you've looked at the executive order, you've seen those aggressive timelines and, you know, they're there for a reason. Um, and, I, and I'm really impressed to see sort of the, the control with the checkbook. Uh, you know, we're seeing a stake in the ground that says, you know, the government's not going to spend money unless you don't just talk about security measures you're taking, but we actually can prove that you're taking them. Um, whether that's, you know, looking at the aggressive, you know, software bill of materials, which is going to really you know, enable, uh, you know, government consumers to say, I'd like to see what's what's in your stuff, which is very important. Um, but, you know, also in the area of threat intelligence and threat sharing, uh, I, I'm going to predict that, you know, as due course, the industry will rally around that. And we won't just see government consumers, you know, requesting that, but but highly regulated financial and medical as well. Um, the standards are good, and 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 reading through it, it, it really does take a lot of combined efforts over the past, and sort of puts them into one big package that says, you know, you need to be able to not only produce a security as effective your product, but also consume your own security and and ensure that the the you know the attack surface that you're producing is um, well and controlled. Um, so, you know, while some areas aren't again, you know, focusing on that executive order, I do expect to see wide adoption. Thank you. Um, thank you, Christine. Um, and, then, and then a question to, um, uh, to all of you, if I may, please. Um, I, I mean, I, we, we touched upon this earlier, but um, how do you feel nation states should balance national security considerations and free market approach in the development of 5G, which is clearly you know, one, of, one of the key enabling factors behind it, and whether the issue of 5 technology misuse by nation states might curb the expansion of these networks? If I could go to Christine, you're in the first instance, please. Sure. Um, you know, China's state security laws mandate that every Chinese citizen and corporation cooperate fully on manners of, you know, state security, including economic security and with criminal implications. Um, it's hard to imagine the nation states we've come to know over the last few years and decades and the activities that, you know, they've waged against us not to believe that they'll leverage that law to advance their interests with strength. Um, it's reflected in the products they manufacture, definitely. Uh, and I believe it would be naive on our part uh, in the greatest sense to believe that they won't leverage this opportunity. Mr. Sweet Manny? Yeah, so I remember reading this interesting book a few weeks back. Uh, it's called This Is How the World Ends by uh, Nicole Perlroth, uh, who's a uh, who's an uh, author from the New York Times. Uh, very interesting. And I think nation states will do, you know, whatever it takes to get ahead. Uh, and, and so I, I don't think it's going to be um, reasonable to expect nation states 
to basically change the way they've been working so far. The nation states will do whatever it takes to get ahead. And there's some recent uh, ruling in the UK as well. So I think that, you know, the hope I think is that for consumers, I'm, I'm hoping that consumers aren't ca caught in the crossfire and um, we can basically evolve into a safer 5G network uh, for all of us as consumers in the future. That's the hope. But I don't, I, I think it would be uh, futile to assume that the way nation states are operating today is going to change sometime in the future. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, thank you Manny. And, and Bill, finally, please. Yeah, thanks. You know, being an operator, what, what I see is the free market approach to wireless is working. You know, look at the past year, three national 5G networks have been deployed. Wireless is such a great engine for economic innovation. And, and where would we be without it uh, during the whole COVID experience? There are several 5G security initiatives underway uh, within the U.S. government. And of course, security was built into 5G standards developed by 3GPP. So in short, you know, I think that the free market approach is, is working pretty well for us. No, th thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, uh, just um, before, we, before we wrap up, I've got two additional questions which have um, uh, pop popped up during this. And um, uh, Manny, you, you, know, you touched upon you know, the array of devices um, out there. Um, in your opinion, how do we patch and protect these devices on a 5G network, given that many of them, as you've alluded to, are not particularly friendly uh, or not particularly user friendly for this type of task? It's a challenge. And uh, as I gave the example earlier, it's going to be very hard to expect a homeowner with no understanding of technology to be, be able to go and patch their refrigerator or their kettle. And we've seen, if you go and look at, look at YouTube, there've been a bunch of publicized hacks on these devices. Uh, but manufacturers are getting better and they're trying to build in security from the start. For example, um, you know, why does a refrigerator need to contact any other domain uh, IP address outside of you know, the address that it needs to patch from? I mean, that's a simple start. Put those guidelines in place. Make sure that you have some restrictions in the chipset so that you know, the data, uh, uh, things like Wi-Fi ID and so on can be securely kept in encrypted fashion, use encryption for everything. So things are, being, things are changing slowly. And I think where we are right now is we're in the second or third generation of these devices where security seems to be a little bit more than an afterthought. But I think uh, you cannot expect security, you cannot expect end users to be completely aware of what their devices are doing, which is why I think defense in depth Defense at different parts of the internet is going to be critical in order to make the internet safer. Thanks, um, thanks, Manny. And and early the, the last question you mentioned um, zero trust networks, which appears to be a, a term that has has found prominence in the um, in, in in recent times. Um, Manny, in the first instance, could you just you know expand upon? You know what we mean by that, and you know how how widely you feel that 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 approach to um, cybersecurity is is being adopted. Yeah, to give a simple example of zero trust, I mean maybe take ourselves twenty years back. Typically, we had a corporate office, and we had all of our crown jewels in that office. Everybody used to come either into the office or you know have a way to connect into the office securely, and we could check. Uh, that their entry was authenticated. And then once they came in, they had access to everything. So this is like the, the castle and the moat analogy where you have everything inside and you get in. Once you're in, you have access to everything. But guess what? COVID has just accelerated this transformation for people working from anywhere. So people are in different locations. You don't know what endpoints they have. You don't know what security they're running. And so the notion of having this castle and moat analogy, I think is outdated, honestly. Um, People are now accessing data from wherever they want, and the data isn't necessarily in your office. It's in cloud data centers. It's in SaaS platforms. And so the concept of zero trust essentially says, you know, don't trust everything. Try to make sure that you create specific security practices, best practices within your organization so that you can make sure that 
you are not, you're validating and, and not, not trusting anybody before you access anything. So you do, it's not just trust but verify, it's actually don't trust but prove who you are before you can have access to anything. And so that's kind of the general technology paradigm. And then a lot of vendors, including us, Akamai, have come up with you know, different approaches to that to protect data and infrastructure within companies. Thank you, uh, Manny. Christine, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, and I, I also want to add on to that. I think, uh, you know, BlackBerry is looking at the same thing with BlackBerry Persona. It's continuous authentication. Not only are you authenticating once you're past the moat and in the front door to data everywhere, but who are you five minutes from now? And if you suddenly log in for, you know, a remote location that you've never been to, you know, in your entire existence, is there something in the way that's going to question, are you really who you say you are? So I think the authentication piece of zero trust is critical, but it really needs to be continuous authentication to make sure that we really truly have a, a, a zero trust approach. Sure, thank you. And, and Bill, finally on, on, on this question, any, any comments from yourself? Yeah, thank you. And you know, I appreciate the comments from Christine and Manny. That's you know, right on, and I fully support it. And you know, it is a shift right now because you know, data is residing everywhere and, you know, the people who access it are, are all, all over the place. So, you know, we really need to push to stronger authentication. We need to push to network embedded controls in your connectivity services. And we really have to embrace security function virtualization. You can no longer put up one big firewall in front of your perimeter because you're going to end up poking a million holes in the thing. So you've essentially got to take the approach where you're using software-based security and shrink wrapping it around those elements uh, wherever they sit, out in the cloud, in a SaaS provider, you know, in your data center. Uh, so it's a whole different approach. Then fundamentally, we need to start to make the shift there. So thank you for today. I appreciate all the comments. Uh, and thank you, Bill. And I, I think, um, you know, what, what's very evident to me is, is clearly the importance of people like yourselves, um, you know, to, to the functions with these industry leading organizations that are already paving the way for this super connectivity that we're, um, we're all going to benefit from as, um, as a nation race. So, um, but before I wrap up, does, uh, do any of you have any, any final comments, um, just with regard to the, the topic of, you know, the, 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 what we've been discussing today. Perhaps I could just go around and, and ask Manny any, any final comments for the audience before I, I wrap up. I just want to say thank you to the panel. I think it was a great discussion. Also, thank you to the audience uh, for listening with us. Thank you. Thank you, Manny. Uh, and Christine? Yeah, I, I also agree. And, and thank you very much for this opportunity. And I, I think my last sort of thought is, is for folks to remember that all of the context that we've talked about today you know, there's a, there's a supply chain happening where products that are, you know, uh, that are going to be connected on, on this 5G superhighway have a supply chain. It's a, a component, you know, combined with a component, which is a, a bunch of open source libraries that have a bunch of attack surface and your end user may not have visibility into all of that supply chain. So it's really going to be critical that we hold our vendors accountable for, you know, all of these new, um, you know, software attack surface that we're, we're introducing with 5G. And that's for me. Thank you. No, no thank you, Christine. Uh, and Bill, finally. Yeah, again, agree with all the comments. Thank you for having us today. I appreciate the panel and uh, you, Alex, for hosting us. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. And, um, and finally, for me, Crisis 24 and Guard Worlds, um, you know, very pleased to have, have had the opportunity to talk um, with such esteemed uh, presenters today. I've, I've certainly learned a lot. Um, I think clearly a, you know, a huge opportunity, as I've, I've just mentioned, but, but something that's super connected also needs to be super secure. And, um, as I mentioned earlier, I think we're in, um, we're in good hands with, uh, with people like the, uh, the speakers that we've spoken about today. So thank you very much and, um, have a good day.